We exalt you, O oh God. Father, we thank you because you are beautiful beyond description and you are too marvelous for words. However, we would not, see, we would not miss out on the opportunity and the privilege to use that which we have to give you praise. We do not attempt to describe your greatness. All we want to do is ascribe greatness to you because you are the rock, because you are the Lord. And we thank you because as we magnify you in our hearts, you in the power that you bring and the grace that you show and the love that you have is magnified in our lives. And so Father, may we not hold back the breath that you have given to us but may we be in constant surrender to you even in our thoughts may we exalt you with all of our actions may we exalt you and father in the mighty name of jesus even in the aspirations of our hearts may we exalt you may we not seek to exalt ourselves even in the thinking of what we think the future holds let us ascribe all greatness to you may we not see ourselves to May we not see a future for ourselves wherein we're so self-sufficient that we no longer need you. May we not see for ourselves a future wherein we're so strong we will not run to you. May we always exalt you as the Savior. May we always exalt you as the rock. May we always exalt you as the lover of our souls. May we always exalt you as the one who is faithful. May we always exalt you as the one that performs all that concerns us. May we always exalt you. Let not just our words exalt you, but let our posture exalt you. Let all of our actions exalt you. Let the attitude of our hearts exalt you. May we always choose humility while we give glory to you, Almighty God. We exalt you, O oh God. We exalt you. Oh, oh Lord. Lord, we exalt you. We exalt you, Jesus. May our hearts sing a melody to you, Jesus. May the expression on our faces exalt you, Jesus. As we move, as we live, let every part of our being exalt you, Jesus. Oh, oh, Lord. We exalt you, Father, because we also know that you have done great things. Because we know that you do marvelous things. Because we know that you do wondrous things. Because we know that you have done so many great things. Because we are confident that you will never fail. Father, we thank you because we know that you are dependable and Lord may we continually give thanks to you for the people the systems the situations and the circumstances that continue to allow for us to have a need for you or that continue to remind us that we need you thank you father for all those people that disappoint us for the systems that fail us because they help to put us in a position of recognizing that only you are able to save. That all the glory belong to you and you alone. Oh, oh Lord. Father, we worship your holy name. Thank you, Jesus. Let us be seated in God's presence. God is good. Oh, hallelujah. Alrighty. Okay, so one, one of the things that I would like for us to do is just to look around. Don't mention any names, just look around. You see some of the people that you don't see? When you see them on Saturday, ask if they went for Halloween. Because I know that they did not go, because these are communion house people, they wouldn't go. But just ask them, because there must be a reason why they're not here. But we thank God because we know the times that we're in, and we also recognize the need and the urgency, the need for, uh, how do you describe it? The need for consistency and the urgency of repentance. And so if you don't mind, y'all, 
that are on that side, if you don't mind, if it's not too much trouble, why don't you come here? Praise the Lord. God is good. And since Cody and Tia are not here, Sister Barbara, why don't you come in here? Because I don't want you to be all by yourself. God is good. All right, it's Saturday. It's fast approaching. Anyone with a great expectation? Come on. <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah. I am excited today. One of my childhood friends is visiting us uh, from Maryland today. Uh, she's here with her daughter. And, um, you know, I told people, I said, I practically raised her. Emphasis on practically. Oh, yes. Uh, you know, um, she and her younger sisters, I always said I was their older brother. You know, just because it made me look good. And so I'm glad to have you here today, Funto, and your daughter, Ayo. Such a joy having you here. Uh, praise the Lord. When she said to us that she was coming into town today, I said, you have to come to church because we meet on Tuesdays. And I said it and forgot about it until she really actually showed up. You know, so it's good to know we still have people of integrity. You know, there are people who will promise you heaven and earth and say, oh, I'm going to be there. They even swear by their phones and don't show up. But we thank God that you're here. God bless you real good. So today before we, uh, um, I, I, I would like for us to start. Okay. Praise the Lord. Um, whatever I would like for us to do might have to wait. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 12. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now let me ask you, did anybody go back to study Matthew after Saturday? Can I see your hand up if you went back to study Matthew because... That means I, I, I did a good job selling you, Matthew, didn't I? Yeah. All righty. God is good. And by the grace of God, I will still, by the grace of God, do my online teaching, um, which I may have to do on TikTok because they have a better camera, but we shall see. Well, you know, Paul said, becoming all things to all men, that by all means I may at least win some. So you may, have, you don't have to become a TikToker. You can just download the app. So I'm just saying, because I think, you know, not every one of us is like Rosemary. Some of us need more camera lights and, and, and you know, you know what I mean. Praise the Lord. When I say, you know what I mean, Kenyatta was supposed to say, hey man, hey man, hey man, hey man. He and I both need a bit more light. So that's why I made, I may do it on that platform. Alrighty. Well, God is good. Um, sometimes when I say things like that, it's because I have another reason, but it's not yet time for me to reveal. Yeah, you already know it's called a placeholder. While well, Caleb is falling the wall of Jericho there. Oh yeah, God is good. Now, the book of Jeremiah, chapter 17. How many people remember what the name Jeremiah means? Alan, you're on a computer. You're not allowed to talk. Because you know you can just giggle. Anybody? Jeremiah, anybody? Chris, anybody? K Kayla is hiding her face like she's like, oh, you're writing. Oh, okay. I believe you. Yeah. Jeremiah means the one the Lord has appointed. Amen. The one appointed by the Lord. And you know, the Bible says that God makes everything beautiful in its time. So when you find a man that is appointed by God, it is only to be expected that his assignment will also be for an appointed time. He is appointed by God, sent to an appointed people for the fulfillment of the will of God in an appointed or at an appointed time. I use the word in and at for time because we are in a particular time and it is also, we are also at a particular time. It's all about the divine appointment of God. And that is the reason why we have been studying or referencing the book of Jeremiah a lot of late, which I believe we would uh, continue to enjoy by the grace of God. And now that we're opening with Jeremiah, it, it, it may be that there is a surprise for us today on the scripture with which we shall break bread. And so if I were you, I would prepare myself and make room for a surprise scripture reading today. Come on now. So verse 12 says, a glorious high throne from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. 
a glorious high throne from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. And so from the beginning, it has already been determined that we will find sanctuary in the Lord. I think I'm sounding great. You know, if, if I haven't even noticed, that means I'm sounding excellent. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Oh, yeah. And so, a glorious high place is the place of our sanctuary. So now come with me to Matthew chapter 12. We're now going to kind of reverse those numbers. Verse 17. Yes, Matthew chapter 12. The book of Matthew, chapter 12. The Bible says that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet. Behold my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he will declare justice to the Gentiles. One of the things that I want to point out to us very quickly is that God is a God of divine appointments. The Bible says from the beginning, the Lord has already appointed for there to be a sanctuary for his elect ones. And not only did he appoint for there to be a sanctuary, he gave us an insight to the authenticity and the dependability of that sanctuary. The Bible says what we have just read in Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 12, that our sanctuary from the beginning is a what? A glorious high place. And now we are reading here in Matthew chapter 12, that that which the Lord has promised shall be fulfilled. That behold my servant in whom I am well pleased, my servant that I have what? Chosen. The word chosen is also the word appointed. It says, I have appointed this servant. He is my beloved servant. I will put my spirit upon him and he will declare justice to the Gentiles. But I want us to focus on this divine appointment that from the beginning, the Lord has made an appointment. He has appointed for us to have a place to go to and it's a place that is a glorious and high place, a throne when God makes a throne your sanctuary, what it means is that the highest authority is concerned about your well-being. That the highest authority is concerned about your safety and the one who would have determined or predetermined from the beginning to declare for there to be a sanctuary is one that is aware that there will be a need for you and I to have a sanctuary. A place to go to when the time comes. And you know, God in his goodness and in his infinite mercy would not gamble with the ones that are beloved to him. God will not allow for you in the day of trouble to find yourself running into a sanctuary that cannot hold true to its purpose and divine agenda. And in order to ensure that that sanctuary is a sanctuary that cannot be touched by unholy hands, a sanctuary that cannot be seen by unholy eyes, a sanctuary that cannot be messed with or made corrupt. What did the Lord do? The Lord made sure that that sanctuary was placed very high. But even if it's placed very high, what if after a while, whatever material it's made, is, the sanctuary is made of begins to crumble? What happens if the end comes and the time of tribulation when we most need that sanctuary comes and we no longer find that sanctuary, what do we do? So this is what the Lord did. The Lord made himself that sanctuary. When the Bible says that it is a glorious high throne, the Lord was talking about the position of the Lord Jesus Christ in the grand scheme of things and how he will be that sanctuary. The Bible says the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous will run into it and they will be saved. Today I want to remind us that we have an assurance that predates every opposition. 
we have an assurance of the promises or by promises of the privileges that we have in him that were already in place before the dawn of time. We have been so secured by God that unless we do not have a revelation of the God that we are dealing with, unless we do not know how much he cares about us, unless we do not believe that we are his beloved, unless we do not believe all of those things, we should never have a reason to struggle to have confidence in that God. You know, one of the things that the Lord's been dealing with me on lately that I've started sharing with you since Tuesday and dwelt a lot more on it on Saturday is that many of us, the Lord comes and he visits us and he finds us sometimes unfaithful. And I described to us that, or I was able to explain to us that the expression, all you of little faith, was a statement. And the other one that says no faith was a question when Jesus says, have you no faith? Because the one asking the question knows that he gave you faith. Because the Bible says that we all have received a measure of faith. Why do we all have a measure of faith? Because God knows that without faith, it is impossible for us to engage an invisible God from a mundane realm. So when God says, whosoever comes to me, I will in no wise cast away, it's because he has an expectation that you already have the resources and the equipment with which to attempt to seek him. Whosoever must come to God must first of all believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. I want you to say, I have faith. You see, the reason why many of us live lives that don't seem to be, lives that aren't evident of the grace of God is that the grace of God only works through faith. The Bible says that by grace have we been saved through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast, not of ourselves. It is the free gift of God. And so when you see that certain things are lacking in your life, that you, you look at your life and it doesn't seem to mirror what it means to be a co-heir of salvation with Christ Jesus. It's not because God hasn't given you faith. It's because we are not convinced that we have that faith. And the Bible says that is a dangerous place to be in. Jesus says to him who has more shall be given. But the one who has none, even that which he has. I'm going to explain that for the sake of my dear sister who just came from out of town. Communion asks people to understand what I've just said in a different way. You know, when the Bible says to him who has, more shall be given, but the one who has none, even that which he has. So, but wait a minute, you just said he has none. So what does he have if he has none? Have you ever wondered what that means? I mean, you already know. Have you ever wondered? The reason why God is saying that is from the perspective of the individual, they don't think they have. But from God's perspective, who already set up a sanctuary from the beginning, he knows that they have, they just don't see what they have. So God says, to him who has, more shall be given. And what does it mean to be the one who has? To be the one who lives in the consciousness of that which you have been given. The reality of it is this, we are multidimensional beings. We, do not exist in, we don't exist in just one plane or the other. We exist in all of these many planes because we are made in the image and in the likeness of God and your God is omnipresent. There is no dimension of existence that you go to. The psalmist said, even if I can develop the wings of an eagle and I'm also able to manipulate time, that was what he meant by saying, if I may try on the wings, if I may travel on the wings of the dawn, because at dawn no one's awake. But he says, even if I have a way of intercepting time, such that before the dawn breaks, I'm, unable, I'm able to get upon the wings of time to go to the ends of the earth. He says, I know that I will find you there. And if your heavenly father, the one in whose image you are made, is multidimensional, I put it to you that you are also multidimensional. Why? Because he says, where I am, there you will be also. And so if you are multidimensional, then what determines the quality of the life that you live or the experiences that you have is the consciousness that you present. Your consciousness is like a reader that determines what track of music your life is playing. 
For the people that are here, born in the 2000s, you may not know what I just said. Back in the day, we had a particular kind of musical instrument that is called the turntable. We need to, I think we may need to baptize Manuel later again. As soon as I said turntable, you needed to have seen her hand. She was like, whoop, whoop, whoop. She was already. Oh, no, she needs more than hands. <laughs> she needs the eldership to come together. But yeah, you're right. Those turntables are what you call them, vinyls with songs already waxed into them. But it doesn't matter how intelligent you are. You cannot read that by just looking at it and smiling. You have a particular kind of reader that can turn the tracks that were waxed into the plastic, turn it into music. And that is what your consciousness is. Because whatever track your reader is on is the music that you play. And that is the reason why Jesus says, the eye is the window of the soul. He says, let your eye be full of light so that your entire soul will be illuminated. Your consciousness, what you're conscious of, is what determines. So you can have your head or your player head stuck on one track. And that's why people say that they're repeating themselves like a broken record because they're just going on and on playing one track, whereas there are several. Many of us have been playing the track of frustration for longer than a season. Many of us have been playing the track of certain kinds of tests. God continues to allow for you to have an opportunity to graduate from the place wherein because of fear and intimidation, you tell a lie and you behave badly. And God is like, how much longer will you be on this track? He says, I have given you the boldness of Yeshua such that there is no situation that should cause you to tell a lie or to behave badly. God is looking for people that will not compromise. Because the reality of it is this, bodily exercises profit little. What are bodily exercises? The things that we do in our body, like fasting, like whatever you can think about that you do in your body. That you know, Sometimes we deprive ourselves of things. All of that, we're doing it in the body. But the Bible says God is happy with that, but he wants you to do more than just practice holy things. He wants you to actually be holy. To be holy means to have a character that is temperate. You have to be a person that is kind. You have to be a person that is long-suffering. And God allows for situations to be, for you to be in situations that test and try to see if you have developed godly character. But many of us, we go through those situations and we keep circling those mountains like the children of Israel. And God says, that is not my will for you. My will for you is to be able to lift that head and play another track and play another track. But you know how that thing works. Another track doesn't play until you are done with one. It's not like now where you can just keep scrubbing from beginning to the end of a track. You know, Gavin, today you can scrub on YouTube when you're watching the video. I'm not even sure if you're allowed to watch YouTube yet, but most of these devices, when you're watching your DVD, do people still watch DVD? Netflix. Yes, how old thou art. You can scrub. In, in, in computer science, we call that random access memory. You can just access different places randomly. But when we were growing up, there was nothing like that. It was only read-only memory. You can only go from beginning to the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that means you've been watching YouTube if you know that, praise God, because they don't teach that in schools. The reality of it is this. I don't suppose they do. That consciousness very much determines what you get out of life and what you get out of the will of God for you. And the Lord's been saying to us that in the season that we are in, we need to be faithful people. Because we all have faith, but we are not all faithful. So to him who has, more shall be given. But the one who has none, who says, there's nothing here. You are first of all calling God a liar. Because the reality of it is that if God has an expectation of you, that I believe that he has already given you the equipment to fulfill that expectation. Otherwise, he would not be a just God. 
There is nobody in the word of God from history that we know of that was ever called by God who did not already possess what they needed. Remember the story of Jeremiah. When God came to Jeremiah, the appointed one. In fact, how can you be called an appointed one and God came to you at the appointed time and you were still telling God stories? The reality of it was that he did not know even his own name. You know, many of us, the reason why we are not able to enjoy the name of God is because we don't even know our own names. You know, because if, if you know that your name is his beloved, then you will enjoy him as the healer. Because God as the healer is committed to healing only his beloved. When Jesus was approached by that woman who said, oh, my daughter is sick. She, she must be tor tormented by a demon. Jesus was like, and so? Jesus was like, so, and so what? Do you know how many stories I've heard today? Jesus says, somebody tell this woman. When you read it again, that was the attitude. He said, let somebody tell this woman that I have not come for people like her. I have come for the lost sheep of Israel. Oh, do you know how offended I would have been if Jesus had said that? You would have accused him of, of being a bigger. You would have accused him of being, of being a chauvinist. Of being a, or you would have accused him of all kinds of things. Because the reality of it is he was talking to someone of a different ethnic group. So basically he was being racist. Like, I, I haven't come with people like you. I'm sorry. But Jesus... <laughs> Wanted to bring out of that woman what he knows that the Heavenly Father put in her. Which is that measure of faith that is resilient in the face of opposition. And so when there is no opposition sometimes, God makes the opposition. In that woman's life, Jesus constituted the opposition. By presenting to her an attitude that should put her off and discourage her. And what did the woman say in return? The woman said, and Jesus, and Jesus explained further, just so that you know, Jesus was like, let's be clear. You do not give the food of the children to dogs. What you're asking for is healing. Healing is the children's meat. But you know what's interesting was this. Even though the woman may not have known herself to be a child of God, she recognized that she was still a creation of God. At the minimum, at least we need to know that we are God's creation. You know, the Bible says that God is the God of all flesh, the Father of all spirits. If at the minimum you cannot, if you can't come to him in sonship, with full confidence in him, that he is your heavenly father, at least come to him as the creator that does not leave any of his creation to go to waste. Jesus told his disciples, he says, you see, the, 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 the lilies, they do not have a job that they go to, and yet Solomon in all of his glory was not as arrayed as they were, arrayed in splendor. He said, but you are of more value than many sparrows. The reality of it is that if only we know the name of our appointment, the name that we're supposed to bear in the appointed time or at the appointed time, we will be able to engage God because faith is that medium through which we have a connection to God. And so we have come to see that some folks, the problem with them, like Jeremiah, was they did not recognize what they have been called by God. And again, the name that we have is a function of what we possess. Let me, let me just take time to explain that because I don't think I've had such opportunities of late, but let me explain what it means. You look at someone like Abraham. Abraham was first of all called Abram when he was made because he was born to somebody who was a royal chief in the courts of Nimrod, right? So stay with me. Um, Abraham's father, his name was what? Terran? He was one of the highest chiefs in the courts of Nimrod. And so when Abraham was born, Abraham was born to royalty. And that was the reason why they called him a prince. His name Abraham means a noble person, someone of nobility, right? And that was why his sister, that ended up becoming his wife, and they're not from the state that you might think. We just have to say that because I know y'all's mind will go there, but now let's bring it back to the scriptures. 
They were from the Ur of the Chaldeans. Okay? And so his sister, who was born after he was born, what was her name? Sarai. Okay? I don't want to weird, you know, have you weirded out. They're not, they weren't born to the same mother. Okay? But they're of the same father. All right? Which makes it, I think, a little better, isn't it? But this was like thousands of years ago. There were not that many people. Let me put it in perspective because I don't want you, I want you to be able to defend what you believe. You know, because people be telling you all kinds of dust about the Old Testament. Like, oh, why, why, why did God support genocide in the Old Testament? Why did God support this in the Old Testament? You have to know what you're dealing with historically because do you know that Noah was still alive when Abraham was born? And Noah was the man who survived the flood with three of his children. So when you put it in perspective, one of the guys that was on the ark, Shem, was the one that raised Abraham when Nimrod wanted to kill him. So when you put it in perspective, there were not that many people around, so the choices were limited. So give Abraham a break. I, I, I feel like being an apologist today. Because when I started saying it, even myself was like, oh my God, what are we, what are we saying here? But Abraham was called Abraham. Why? Because he had something. What did he have? He had the privilege of nobility. He was supposed to be a prince. Right? Sarah was called Sarai. Sarai, which means a princess. That was because of what they had. And the moment God came and God gave them a word that will now make them more than just nobility, that will make them a posterity, he changed their name. So Abraham or Abram went on to become Abraham, which went from being a noble man to being a noble father. And Sarahi was called, Sar, was called Sarah. And my understanding of the reason why I got of the, 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 the twist in her, in her name or the change to her name is this. When you look at Sarah going to Sarai or Sarai going to Sarah and you do the etymology, you don't actually find a word like Sarah. All the times that the word Sarah appears in your canonized Bible, I think all of maybe 73 times or so, it always means the same thing. And that's because it is not even a word that people used. But when you look at the, etym the, the structure of the word, it's like the name Ava, Eve. God says she will be called Ava because she's going to be the mother of all living. And when you look at that name, it's a life-giving name. Most names that end with a breath are life-giving names. Ava, it gives life. Sarai keeps life. But Sarah gives life. So God will give you a name that is a function of what he has given to you so that even your name announces your privilege that you may be without excuse. Jeremiah was called the one who has an appointment with God because God was coming at an appointed time to unveil certain things to humanity through his ministry. He answered that name all his life without even knowing what it meant until God came and rebuked him and rebuked his ignorance. When God came to him and God told him all of what he wanted to do through him, he was like, uh, are you talking to me? He says, no, no. God says, yeah, I'm talking to you. He said, but God, I am but a youth. And God says, do not say that. You know what it means? I am but a youth. What he was trying to say is that I am not equipped to do what you are asking. And the Lord is saying, even before you were formed in the belly, I knew you. The beauty of something that already existed before you being deposited into you is that you carry something that takes eternity to perfect. Because outside of time, it was formed. And then it was introduced to you when you were conceived in your mother's womb. And so God had to remind Jeremiah that, look, you already have an appointment with me. That is what you possess, and that is what your name describes. So let us go back to the verse of scripture that we read in Matthew chapter 12. What did God call his servant in Matthew chapter 12, verse 17 that we read? He says, my beloved. And so if I am his beloved, that means I carry his love. And that is the reason why he will call me by that name because of what I possess. 
So let it not be said amongst you that there is a thing that you lack because the word of God says you have all things, especially a measure of faith. So now we know that we have. And for us to have means what? That we can continue to have. Because the Bible says to him who has, more shall be given. The reason why it is critical for us to know this is because God is calling us to faithfulness. And faithfulness is what is perpetual possession of faith that you are conscious of. The faith that you have perpetually resides within you, but for you to have it or for you to be able to operate by it, you need to be perpetually conscious of it because you are multidimensional, so your read ahead, which is your consciousness, must always be laced with faith. The way that I like to describe it is this. Whenever you need to go and address a situation in your thoughts, in your home, around you, in a conversation, first of all, dip your tongue in faith. Before you speak in that situation, so that when you speak in that situation or you address that situation, when you engage in that conversation, you're engaging in that conversation as someone who has faith. And that consistency is what it means to be faithful. On Saturday, I told us that the, 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 the translation of Deuteronomy 32 that says God himself speaking, I will turn my face away from you because you have no faith, is the word lo amun. And lo means no, but amun does not just mean faith, it means faithful. And to be faithful, like I told you, is from the word amen, which sounds like a man, like a faithful man. A man. The word a man means to be steady, to be consistent, to be as you expect it to be. That is the reason why when we pray, we say amen at the end of the, of the prayer because that is another inflection that means let it be so. So to have faith is to have the resolve that it will be as it has been said. So when you have faith, that means you believe God's word is as it should be. That is what it means to have faith. So in the New Testament that was written in Greek, the word, all oh, you have little faith, why have you or have you no faith? The word faith there is the word pistis, which means the ability to actually believe. So that translation is spot on. The Old Testament one is the one that we need to fully consider as being faithful instead of faith. Now, God isn't just looking for people that have faith. He's looking for people that are faithful. And the reason why God is looking for people that, have, that are faithful over the people that have faith is because God doesn't just want to deal with you at some random instance of your life. He wants to be able to deal with you all the time. And to deal with you all the time, you need to be able to present faith all the time. So having faith all the time, being consistent, being steady, and being firm all the time is what it means to be faithful. So whenever he comes to you, he finds faith. And I liken faith and being faithful to having power and having strength. Faithfulness is to faith as strength is to power. Power is that mom, mom, instant or what you will call, what's the word people use here, momentary. Right? The, the instance or, or the moment that, or, of being able to show ability is power. If, you, if I can demonstrate that I've got the ability to do something, that means I have the power for it. But can I always do that thing? Or am I able to apply that power until work is done, until change has happened? If I'm able to do that, then I have shown what? Not power, but I have shown strength. Does it make sense? Now, when you look at what God is letting us know here, God is sending us that in the season that we're in, he's not just looking for people who can believe his word, on Monday, and when the challenge comes on Tuesday, they drop the ball and run. The example, or one example that helped me to understand this principle was the parable of the talents. Remember that the Bible says that there was a ruler who was going to a far country. He was going to another dimension. And he said to his servants, three of them, that I want you to do business till I come. Does that sound familiar? When Jesus was leaving, what did he tell his disciples? He says, do business till I come. The word he used we, was, is most, mostly translated as occupy till I come, right? The word occupy 
is the root of the word occupy is to be engaged in profitable business. That's what it means. Which will be a better description of the places that we'll go to to earn money. It should be, it's better called an occupation than a job. Because a job is what you hate. The word job means that which is hated from the name Job, right? The word work is from, is from, is from an ancient English word that means to be tortured. So, the, so, yeah, so sometimes if you say, oh, I'm, pastor says don't say job anymore, let's say you're going to work. Well, <laughs> yeah. But it's okay because I don't mind saying that I'm going to work simply because that word torture has to do with something that is rigorous, something that, if, that, that takes out of you pleasure, that could potentially make you feel that you are being pressed. But that's what God says. The Bible says, by the sweat of the brow shall you eat and by the labor of your brawn shall the ground produce for you. That's what the Lord said, that you would toil to eat. So it's not too bad to use the word. But I like the word occupation because to be occupied means to be engaged in profitable business. So when Jesus was living, he says, therefore, do business until I come. Occupy till I come, right? And then you apply that to the parable. The man said, all three of you do business till I come. And I believe the three represents the Jews, the Gentiles, and the unbelievers. Alrighty, because there was one that was given way more. And there was another one that was just given enough. But there was one that was given only one. And to him, he concluded that that was not enough. So because it was enough, not enough, it was nothing. Now that's why when Jesus came, Jesus said, again, Jesus had said prior when he was teaching his disciples what it means to go into ministry and what it means to be able to operate by the authority, of, by the authority that he gives. That was the first time he told them that to him who has more shall be given. But he repeated that expression when he was talking about the parable of the talents. When he said that servant was given one talent and he buried it. So he was the one who had, but after a while he stopped having because he left it. Does it make sense? So does it make sense now wherein the Bible says to him who has more shall be given and the one who has none, even that which he has will be taken away from him because even though he walked around as a penniless and talentless fellow, the reality of it was that even though he was telling everybody I don't have anything to do business with, I don't have anything to trade with, is not true because God gave him something to trade with. So sometimes we're like, oh, I wish I could believe like that person. I wish I had faith like that person. No, the reality of it is you have faith. You just left it where God spoke to you. Because many times we forget that wherever God speaks to us is where he has his name. And where he has his name is where he has his presence. You know, my wife and I were doing a little Bible study today. And I was pointing to her something that I had just really thought about. And she was like, oh, I was just studying that. I was like, okay, but I'm still going to tell you what I found. You know, and I told her, I said, look, here the Bible says, whatsoever two or three of you shall agree concerning when you pray, I will do it. You know, that's where we normally stop when we quote that scripture. Do you know what follows it? Right? Matthew chapter 18, verse 19, I believe. It says, Whatsoever you ask in agreement, two of you, I will do it because wherever two or three of you are gathered in my name, I will be there. The power of agreement is not just because both of you, when you combine your powers, you become like um, um, the rangers, the power rangers. That's not what it is. It is not that your power, it's not that my power and her power becomes exponentially magnified just because we've come together. It becomes more potent because when we come together, we evoke his presence. His presence is the guarantee to the power that we present. Can we read it together? It says, again, I said to you that if two of you shall agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven, why? He says because for where? He says for. The word for is the same thing as the word because. He says for where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Now let me bring everything together for us. The reason why God expects us to recognize that we have received the measure of faith 
is because if we are not identifying with that faith, we are asking for the rest of our experiences to be as that of a person who has not been favored by God. Because the Bible says that which he has will be taken from him. Like I told you, God gives and God takes away. So he gives you a measure of faith, but he doesn't take that faith from you. What he takes from you is the privilege to be able to obtain any more. Because it is by privilege that you obtain that initial grace. You didn't labor for it. But when you're not using that grace, it just lets you miss out on what's next, simply because God is not the author of confusion, neither is he a perpetrator of waste. If you're not using it, the Bible says, let not your honor be given to another. So here is the deal. I'm going to see if I can bring everything together in two minutes, and then we're going to break bread. From the beginning of time, God has already created for, a, for you to have a place, a sanctuary, where you are provided for in the day of trouble. And that sanctuary is referred to as a glorious throne. And then in Matthew chapter 12 verse 17, we see that his servant, his beloved, the one that he has sent with a name that is above every name is actually that sanctuary because when we run into him, we are saved. And in order for us to be able to find that sanctuary, we can only navigate to that sanctuary by bringing out the beacon of faith because that sanctuary cannot be found, but it can find you. And so when you bring out your faith in his name and you call his name, guess what happens? He then brings that throne to you because he's been lifted up, he's glorified, he's sitting at the right hand of the Father. He's that sanctuary that is up above in that glorified throne, but he says, I can bring that throne to you whenever you call. Because wherever I am, I am there by my name. That's what Bethel means. Bethel means the abode of God by his name. Because Abraham says, this place will be called Bethel because the name of the Lord is here. Jacob came and said the same thing. This place will be called Bethel because the name of the Lord is here. So the name of the Lord is that sanctuary. And that sanctuary can be accessed only by faith. And you cannot just access that sanctuary in a moment. You need to keep that presence lasting in your life for you to be able to draw all of what you need for it. Imagine if you are being chased by someone with a gun. And you run into a house that is bulletproof. But that house exists only for two seconds. As soon as you run into the house, you're like, oh, thank you, Jesus. Then the house disappears. That house can only be sustained by faith. And so for, that, for you to enjoy the faithfulness of God, you need to present faithfulness. And that faithfulness that you present is faith that is consistent, that is unwavering. Which means even though I am in that house and I'm hearing gunshots, I tell myself, no evil shall befall me. We are a people of an appointed time. And the time that the Lord has appointed for us to exist in is a time that Jesus said he beheld and it didn't look good. He says, when I return, will I find faith on the earth? He said, I hope so. There might have been a scarcity of faith. Not because God did not give faith, but because people have not added to their faith. Because people have not remained in faith. Because people have not presented consistently without fail, faith. And that is the reason why, thank you, Kenyatta, I appreciate that. That is the reason why he says, will I find faith on the earth? And why is faithfulness or faithfulness not to be expected at the time of tribulation? Simply because when tribulation comes, when troubles come, when trials come, they do not only come to your physical being, they also come to your emotional being. And in the face of trouble, our emotions take over. And the emotions, if they have not been well-trained and schooled, will not go to confidence or courage. They would go to fear and panic. 
And when they do that, they overshadow your faith such that when anyone who has come to help you beholds you, they do not see you as a candidate for help because they see no faith because you are so enveloped in fear. And now that the Lord is sending his angels who are the reapers into the field to separate the weeds from the tears, he's bringing his winnowing fan with him to separate the wheat from the chaff, the chaff rather from the wheat, and to gather them into the fire to burn them. The Lord is saying, I am looking for those people who have faith. And when the Lord schooled me on this subject, the very first application, or one of the first applications that he gave to me of the subject of having faith all the time is to believe that God and his faithfulness will punish all foolishness. Jesus told his disciples, he says, offenses will not but come, but happy is he who is not offended for my sake. And as soon as that message settled within them, he followed it up with another message. He said, offenses will not but come, but woe is he by whom the offenses come, because they will not go unpunished. The Lord said to me to have faith is to believe that not only have I given you the ability to be patient with people, but I'm also giving you the ability to know that I will deal with them and not you. One of the things that we have to overcome in the body of Christ as the ecclesia in the times that we're in is unforgiveness. Unforgiveness. It was one of the things that was most taught by Jesus. He said there was a servant whose master forgave him 10,000 talents. And simply because he prayed, he says, be patient with me, I will pay all. And another person was owing him only 100 denarii. And it was like, and that other person said the exact same prayer. Be patient with me, I will pay all. And he says, no, 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 no. No, 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 no. You're not going to pay all. I don't care. I'm not going to be patient. And they took him and sent him into prison. And the Bible says the servants of the master that forgave him, they heard what he said and they reported to the master. Do you know who those servants are? It's not Manuel Lida that will report your unbelief. It is not Rosemary that will report your unforgiveness. It might be me because sometimes I like to tell on people I'm a last born. I tell on people. But the people that reported to the master called the servants of the master are the angels. And these angels are very present, going up and down the ladder. They take up the ladder, a report of your current state, and bring down a blessing that is appropriate for that state. To some people, the blessing that is appropriate for their current state is a blow. Because the Bible says, as a crown is fitting for the head of a king, so are mighty blows for the mouth of a fool. And so, who is a fool? The one who says in his heart that there is no God. If I truly have faith that God exists, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him, and the one who would punish the ones by whom offense come, why then do I want to take the laws into my hands to punish somebody for their foolishness? Why do I want to catch up with that person that cut me in front in traffic? So that I can overtake them and give them the dirty look, the bombastic side eye. Why do you do that? You do that because something within you tells you that they should not go scot-free. Do you know that after Jesus told his disciples that you need to believe that God will take care of the ones by whom offenses come? He said, you, don't be offended for my sake. Do you know what followed that expression, that teaching? In the same breath almost, you know what Jesus told them? He said, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, cut it off. If your feet or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. He said it is better for you to enter the kingdom of heaven lame than to have your entire being go to hell. So I said, Jesus, was, was Matthew tired of going to another page when he wrote this? Because he wrote it together. And the Lord Jesus said to me, he said, no. He said, I said it together. He said, because those things are the things that we use to punish people by whom offenses come. We punish them with our hands, we punish them with our feet, and we punish them with what? With our eyes. We give people that look of disdain to let them know that they're being silly. You want to punish them. 
you give them your hand sometimes. And I'm not going to make any hand gestures, but you all know what I mean. People do that all day in traffic. Almost every time in Atlanta, you keep fing seeing fingers fly everywhere. You understand what I mean? And sometimes, if the person is close enough, you actually whack them with a dirty slap. And Jesus is saying, I have already told you, do not be offended. Be confident that I, who promised, will deliver what I have said. Leave them to me. You be on your way and not be offended. Don't even give them the look. Jesus says, if your eye will cause you to sin, stop giving them the look. One day the Holy Spirit asked me, he says, why are you trying to see that person? You know, because sometimes you just want to see. And I said, because I, I have a feeling they are this kind of person. And then the Holy Spirit said to me, okay, so is that you judging them or you are just being... You know, you're doing an investigation. I said, I'm investigating so I can judge them. He said, stop doing it. You know, sometimes you, you speed up just to go and see. Yeah, it's a lady. Yeah, that's how they drive. And then you come. <laughs> if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. The Lord is saying that in this season, see, let me tell you something. I took my time today to explain all of that because about two occasions today, the Lord said to me, he said, those things that you have already spoken of, I need you to go over them again so that everybody gets it very clearly. Does it make sense? Simply because you need to know the difference between having faith. We all have faith. But to be faithful means to have that faith always. In the face of difficulty, the tribulation that we are in is not the tribulation that is intended just to punish our bodies with hunger and our bank accounts with brokenness. It is a tribulation that is supposed to bring out the worst of us, to make us swear, to make us unforgiving, to make us complain, and to make us speak things that are not holy. The Bible says, and when God revealed the time of tribulations to Daniel, in Daniel chapter 11, one of the very last chapters that he wrote, he saw that when the time of tribulations came, people started to speak negative things. He says the ones that are given to deception started to say there is a casting down. But those who know their God, they say there is a lifting up. They will be strong and they will do exploits. Satan is not looking for your money. He can print as much as he wants. He has a machine for that. But guess what he's looking for? He's looking for your soul. And that is the reason why we cannot be without faith. Simply because our souls are not meant to be exposed to this tribulation without the sanctuary that Jesus is. And Jesus is only going to let you into that sanctuary. He's told his disciples, you're only going to come in here if you have forgiven. And you are only going to be forgiven when you forgive others. So as stupidity and foolishness continues to increase in our world, your tolerance also has to increase. You need to increase. You need to have your faith increased. When Jesus told his disciples what, what was about to happen to them, they didn't say to Jesus, can you just take us before it happens? They said, just increase our faith. How many people want to ask the same today? Lord, increase my faith. But to increase your faith begins with you acknowledging that you already have been given some faith. And to build on that faith means you need to be ready to bring out that faith all the time. And this practical application that the Lord wants us to ensure, the Lord wants to ensure that we have overcome this level. Okay? This level of people doing things to us and, and, and we struggle to forgive. Like I told you, at the minimum, at least know how to forgive. And if you do that well enough, you will know how not to be offended. The Bible says our senses are sharpened by reason of use. Practice forgiveness to the point wherein you become immune to offense. Can I tell you something about faith? And being faithful, what it does to you? When you practice having faith enough to the point wherein you are found by God faithful because you are consistently speaking life, consistently believing that God would do that which he promised, you will find it very difficult to be offended at what anybody is doing. You know why? When you become as he is, the Bible says, be holy as your heavenly father is holy. When you have been faithful 
Like he is faithful. Guess what begins to happen? You begin to see people the way God sees them. And so that person that is persecuting you, while he was still called Saul, you will see him as Paul. And you will rejoice simply because you now become a part of his testimony that will bring light to a Gentile nation. How many one of us, how many of us will not volunteer to be a part of what God is doing? Honestly, if you know that God is doing something, will you not volunteer to say, God, <laughs> I want to be part of it? Because we are called to be co-laborers with him. We all have a badge that says we work here where God works. We wear the same badge that he wears. Because we are called laborers with him. And so whenever God is doing a thing, you want to volunteer. Imagine if you worked for Tesla. And one day they say that Elon Musk is coming to work in your division. You will not call that day off. You're not going to phone in sick. Even if you have to drag yourself there with like four. Let me not prescribe any medicine. Because you're going to wonder how come I know it works. You have Instagram for that. Even if you have to drug yourself with painkillers, you can see me later, I'll tell you. You will make sure you go there. Why? Simply because the owner of the work is coming to work alongside with you. Such a privilege would only be avoided by the ones who do not know that it's a privilege. Only the ones that do not know that it's a privilege will be the ones that will avoid it. But if you know that it is a privilege, guess what? You will be there. David says, better is it to spend one day in God's house than a thousand elsewhere. He said, in fact, I'm a king over the most powerful nation in the world. And at that time, the wealthiest nation in the world. He says, I am that king. He said, but I would rather be a gatekeeper in the house of God just so that I can be close to where God is. Just so that I can, you know, because David knows that when you have the presence of God with you, with one finger, you can slay the lion. With just your pinky, you can destroy a bear. And the reason being, and I've told you before, when David was, was relegated to the backside of the desert, when he was sent into the wilderness to look after his father's flock, they thought they were doing him a disservice. The man was trying to protect his political career and his reputation. He sent David. Do you know that the same place where they sent him to to watch the sheep was the closest region to where the Philistines were? And the Philistines, they captured the ark of God and it was giving them trouble. So they took the ark of God to the backside of the settlement. Israel was here. Philistine, Philistine was here. The Philistines had the ark of God in their midst. It was troubling them. They put it at the end of their territory. David was causing embarrassment because he was a bastard child. They took him out of the house. They brought him to the end of the territory. He was right next to the ark of the covenant and his life was different. Things happen differently when you have the presence of God. That is the reason why wherever two or three of you are, he is in the midst of them. And that presence allows for whatever you decree to happen expeditiously. So many nuggets have been dropped in here tonight. But let it not just be for emotional excitement. Let it be for an equipping. You know, I told you that we have a short time to be equipped. Because very soon, we're going to be called to battle and it's exciting oh come on it is exciting <laughs> hallelujah so we're going to break bread today by the grace of god from the book of mark we're going to read the book of mark chapter 1 verse 2 and then we're going to proceed from there maybe read another verse from the book of luke but let's just go to mark chapter 1 verse 2 the bible says in Mark chapter 1 verse 2, as it is written in the prophets, this particular one was said by Isaiah. So if you have a good Bible, it should tell you that that prophet is Isaiah. As it is written in the prophets, behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. He said, I send my messenger before your face. Then the other part of it that he's talking about who will prepare the messenger before you was emphatically said by Malachi. 
Remember Jesus quoted Malachi quite a bit when he was talking to his disciples about who John the Baptist was. He quoted Malachi chapter 3 verse 1 when he was telling them that the messenger would go before him and that one would come in the power of Elijah. He quoted Malachi chapter 4 verse 5 and 6 where he was telling them that that Elijah had already come and it was John the Baptist who turned the hearts of the father to the sons and the sons to the father. You see, this person who was reading here was, a, was somebody who had learned from the way Jesus spoke that Jesus, the word of God, quoted the word of God. So if Jesus said things that were already written, you and I, we need to know what's already written. So if you've not been studying your Bible, that's a motivation. He says, behold, I send my messenger before your face. He will prepare your way before you. Hold that thought. Come with me to the book of Luke. And we're going to read Luke chapter 16, verse 9. And both of them will be our bread breaking scripture. He says, and I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon. That when you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. He says, make friends for yourself by unrighteous mammon. Now, I want to quickly draw a parallel here very quickly and then we're going to break bread. Jesus is saying that John was the messenger that went ahead of me to prepare the way. So John prepared the way for Jesus. Jesus prepared the way for you so that you can come into everlasting life. Right? And the Bible says that also with unrighteous mammon, you can make friends for yourselves that will prepare for you an everlasting home. So, okay, wait a minute. Who prepares for me to get to that everlasting home? Is it unrighteous mammon or is it a faithful messenger or the loving savior? The answer is this. The reason why Jesus was talking about unrighteous mammon is this. The Bible says if you are unfaithful in unrighteous mammon, who will commit into your hands the true riches of the kingdom? That's what the Bible says. That if you are unfaithful in unrighteous mammon, that which you can see and hold with your hand, who will give you? But if you can demonstrate faithfulness in unrighteous mammon, then you qualify to benefit from the path that has been drawn by the Savior to give you everlasting life. God says, if you do not love men that you see, how can you claim to love God that you do not see? So I put it to you today, friends, that your faith and your ability to trust God is being tested, and you need to be able to demonstrate that in how you treat people. Because every one of those people that you engage and you encounter presents an opportunity for your way to be prepared. For your heart to be greed of pride. For your heart to demonstrate that you will hold on to humility and that you will choose patience and kindness over judgment. The Bible says if you know what it means that the Lord desires mercy over judgment, you will not blame the guiltless. The people that will struggle the most to forgive are the ones who do not even know that they have wronged us. They're guiltless. They don't feel any guilt. They don't even feel bad. And that hurts you. It makes you feel bad. And the Lord is saying, yeah, that's okay. They're helping to prepare the way. Because as long as you're bringing that pride, you cannot come into everlasting life. This is all working for you. By so doing, by allowing them, you fulfill all righteousness. By allowing them to get away with the lies that they're told in you. By allowing them to get away with all the maltreatment. Guess what happens? You are fulfilling all righteousness because you don't have to take it. You're not on their level. John the Baptist came to prepare the way for Jesus and told Jesus, Jesus, I can't baptize you because you're not on my level. You're much higher than where I'm at. And Jesus was like, what does it matter? I need this to fulfill all righteousness. You need every one of those people to fulfill all righteousness. I know they annoyed you. They made your life difficult. But look at you today. Aren't you stronger for it? Did you not pray more because those people were a thorn in your flesh? Did you not seek God more because of all the trouble that they brought? So why, is, why are they a disadvantage to you? Why do you not celebrate and rejoice? Jesus says, love your enemies and pray for them. Simply because the work that they're doing in your life, you, you want them to do it, not God. Because the Bible says it is a fearful thing to fall into the hand of the almighty God. So I put it to you today. Let gratitude and joy be the strength of your life. Rejoice in all of these things. Jesus says when men persecute you, when they revile you, when they lie on you, he says rejoice 
He says, because for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Why did he say that? Because when they revile you and do all of those things, they're helping to prepare the way. They may be unrighteous. What is that to you? They're helping you fulfill all righteousness. And that is how you make it into eternal life. So communion house, it doesn't matter what culture is out there. One thing that we are committed to in this place is that one day every one of us, by God's grace, will have that t-shirt with the number three on it. That means we are of the level of those who do not even register offense. We will get there by faith in the mighty name of Jesus. We will get there because we believe that the one who paid the price paid the price once and for all. And if those people have already been died for, then why do I need to kill them for their sins? We're going to be forgiving people by the grace of God and we're going to be people who actually do not take offense. So as we break bread today, let us thank Jesus for the price that he paid. Let us thank him because he fulfilled all righteousness. He paid for all righteousness. He settled all debt. So I do not have to hold anybody to a debt that is already included in the one that I was forgiven of. It doesn't matter what they do. They may not even acknowledge it. They may be the guiltless, but they will get nothing but mercy from me. The Bible says, owe no man nothing but to love. I do not owe you any lesson to teach you so that you can be a better person by doing it the unrighteous way. No, the Lord will teach you. The Lord himself will take care of where that person is. As for me, it is an opportunity to grow in love. It is an opportunity to grow in temperance, to grow in patience. We will be changed this season. We will be changed. Father, we thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for your body that was broken and your blood that was shed. Because you made a way for us to the Father, a way to come into eternal life. Your body was pierced so that we can go through. And your blood was shed so that we can have your life. May we extend that which we have received freely unto others. You said as often as you have the opportunity, do this in remembrance of me. Lord, as we break bread today, let it be symbolic of what we're about to start doing, which is to give ourselves for others as you gave yourself for us. Jesus says, as often as you have the opportunity, every opportunity that presents itself for you to give yourself to others, you will no longer miss. You will seize those opportunities gladly and gallantly to demonstrate forgiveness. You will say like Jesus said, as his body was being broken and his blood was shed, he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, help us to say that every time that we are offended, every time that we are being derided by the guiltless, let us choose to say, Father, forgive them for they know not what we do so that there will be no hindrance in our way so that through the way we handle the unrighteous mammon, Lord, we will secure for ourselves that eternal home in the mighty name of Jesus because we will be faithful, we will be kind, we will be loving, we will be forgiven, and we will not register offense. In Jesus' name, you may eat of the Lord's body and drink of his blood in remembrance of him. We are making a fresh commitment to the Lord in this season to stop being like ordinary people. The Bible says quit being like ordinary men. People who want to get back. People who want vengeance. People who are irritated and offended. No, we will not be like them. We will be the ones who do, who do not take offense. In the mighty name of Jesus. You may eat and drink. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We appreciate you. I'm just going to read this verse of scripture to us as we close out and I just want us to thank God for those of us who are already beginning to apply these things to our hearts the beginning of today's message was when the, the Lord was dealing with me concerning the vision that I had seen and I had seen the vision of, of a couple of people in here who were inclining their ears to that which I had said on Tuesday and Saturday and the Lord said to me he says they're leaning in but certain things are still not connecting Help them to connect what it means to have faith. 
So I thank God for you all. I thank God for your dedication to the word of God and recognizing that the spirit of the Lord is saying all these things unto the churches that we may be thoroughly furnished unto every good work. And you know that person that you must send this message to. You already know who they are. So as soon as it's out, when does this one come out again? This is Tuesday. So Thursday, isn't it? Yeah, by the grace of God, Thursday evening when it's out. If you cannot wait till then, come to the group. People like um, Brother Greg usually have an audio recording. If you can't wait, solicit for some audio recording. But there are people that you need to send this thing to. Simply because they need the divine ability of God that is accessible by faith to rise above all sentiments and to lose their bad behavior of unforgiveness. Malachi chapter 1 verse 7. The Lord says, you offer defiled food on my altar. But say, in what have we defiled you? By saying that the table of the Lord is contemptible. What is the Lord saying here? The Lord is saying, you offer what? Defiled food on my altar. What is the, how, do you, how can you offer a defiled, defiled food on, your altar, on, on God's altar? Jesus says, when you bring your sacrifice to the altar, and you remember that someone has an ought against you. He says, leave that sacrifice and go and make peace. Because if you ignore the tugging of your heart due to an offense, and you say that you're making some kind of sacrifice unto the Lord, oh Lord, I just want to spend time with you today. I just want to love on you. The Lord is saying you are bringing a defilement to the altar. Uh, this is not Moses Anderson. This is Malachi. Look at what it says. You offer the fast food on my altar. This is how serious God takes it. I beg of you in Jesus' name. Let them go. Don't, don't tell yourself, I think I've let them go. No. Say, Lord, have I let them go. Let him reveal to you where you're truly at. So that by so doing, you allow the working of the Holy Spirit in you. Completely and thoroughly. I know folks have been delivered in here tonight. So thank you, Jesus. So one of the things that I didn't say earlier, I'm just going to say quickly, is this. I have seen the power of God in this place. I have seen power from on high in this place. And that is the reason why this word comes so strong because of the fact that God does not want anybody who has been waiting for this power to not be able to draw from this power when it comes. Don't let another man or woman outside of this place disconnect you from what God is doing in here. All your sacrifice and your labor of love will not be in vain the day of the Lord's visitation at communion house. So prepare your heart. So that when the Lord brings his altar into this place, you will be that sacrifice without guile. You will be that sacrifice without reproach. A sacrifice without contempt. The Lord says, you think my altar is a contemptible altar? He says, there is no contempt here. No contempt here. No reproach. Everything has to go. So I want to encourage you. Let the day of the Lord's visitation not pass you by. Because we do not know when next the angel of the Lord will come to stir the waters. Lighten the load, prepare your heart. Even if it's your spouse and you have swept it under the carpet, open the carpet and blow it completely out. Don't plan to revisit it another day and say, you never know, you know, I just don't know how I'm going to feel next year. No, do it by faith and let it go. I'm going to pray for you and then we're going to close. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, Malachi chapter 1, again, you can, I'm praying for you so you can, I would, I would be in, an, in a posture to receive. I pray for you today, Matthew chapter, Malachi chapter 1 verse 9. I entreat in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ over you today, the favor of God. That he may be gracious to you. And that he will accept you favorably. That the Lord will be gracious to you. That he will accept you favorably. 
I pray for you today in the mighty name of Jesus. I entreat in that name that is above every other name, in that name that is a sanctuary, that you will find that favor afresh so that you can then pass on the favor to others. Let there be a renewal of your engagement of the favor of God so that any favor that may have been stale between you and another man, between you and unrighteous people, that that favor will be renewed also that you may be able to release. Let them go and let your heart be light before the Lord that you may be acceptable before him because you are that sacrifice. Ikundilia ame, si ame, akunde ame, isinde ame. Let me pray for those who may have struggled to forgive certain people. As I was praying and pointing my finger, you may not have seen it, but what I was pointing at was what the finger of the Lord was pointing at. And these are images, they, are, they look like portraits on the wall, but they're actually like video screens they're portraits but when you look at them they animated the move and the lord says as he was pointing that finger that they are being pulled down and i saw them being pulled down so some of the indelible marks of pain and trauma that those offenses have left in your heart they are the reasons why you find it difficult to forgive because every time you look at those pictures you see the offense all over again and it reestablished itself in your life. And the Lord is pointing at them now. He's pointing them out to you. Agree with the Lord in humility and gladness of heart. And those things will be pulled down. The Lord is healing you of trauma. The Lord is healing you of those experiences that left you broken. The Lord is healing you of the details. He's helping you to get rid of the details of what they did to you. That you have mulled over so much so that it has become indelible upon your heart. The day the Lord sets you free, for whom the Son sets free is free indeed. This is the reason why he wanted you to have faith and to engage him by faith. Because when you engage him by faith, you receive the grace to walk in the fullness of that freedom. You are healed of the trauma of the disappointment. You are healed of the trauma of the abuse. Every image and every memory that continues to torment you of what they did, of what they failed to do. The Lord pulls it down by his holy finger today that you may be favorably acceptable unto him. Holy Ghost, Rakulo Mondoya. This is the reason why we have to dedicate our lives to being intercessors. Because when someone stands in the gap for other people, it ushers in the power of the Almighty. I was getting ready. I looked at the time. I'm like, man, the time is fast spent. I was ready to go down. But I'm like, why would I go to sit when there is such a burden still? And the Lord said to me, let's do something about it. And that was why he took me to Mark, Malachi chapter 1 verse 9. And he said to me, you are the one that will entreat my favor today on the behalf of the ones who are weak. And that is the reason why I say that I entreat for you in the mighty name of Jesus, the favor of the Lord, so that you become a favorable sacrifice, so that there is no guile remaining in you. The Lord is healing you right now. I see people being stitched up. The Lord is sewing you back up because he's already removed from you that which he did not put there. He is sewing you back up and the balm of Gilead is melting your wound away. And let me tell you something, in the mighty name of Jesus, it will be as though it never happened. The only way we would know that you have been through is now because we find you in the sanctuary that is from the beginning. The only way by which we would know that you have gone through is because now we see you operating in the wisdom of God. The only reason why we would know is because now we see you and you wear with boldness and with gladness of heart and in all humility that shirt that says, now you are one who takes no offense. You are wearing that your number three jersey by the grace of God because you are no longer retaining offense. You are becoming at that lamb of sacrifice without blemish because the Lord seeks such. Communion house, you are blessed indeed. Hallelujah. God is good. Let's celebrate the Lord again.
for such a night of deliverance. God is good. Thank you, sir. I'm not going to hold this. The given details will be on the screen. We'll give in obedience tonight. How many know that so much has been poured out to us tonight? Amen. And let's take up this opportunity with cheer to give unto the Lord, to show our appreciation to the elders that he has set before us, amen. The given details on the screen, several ways to give. Cash app, dollar sign, communion house, PayPal at communion house, as well as the Zelle information and the communion house website as well. Hallelujah. God is good. And I just want to remind us of the charge that has been placed before us from the man of God concerning this place, the facility that the Lord has blessed us to use in this season. And uh, I want us to be encouraged to really draw to give uh, as the Lord is leading us, I remember a word that the Lord, uh, or that the Lord gave through Pastor Moses, maybe uh, last Tuesday or the Saturday before. Uh, about this time, how many remember that uh, he ministered to us, the midwives, helping us birth? You know those things. And around about that time, we were reminded that we were going to hear the instruction of the Lord clearly. And some of those instructions were, were, were things that we may, uh, you know, uh, uh, it, it may be a push to do. You see what I'm saying? But the grace has been made available to that. And so let's be in remembrance of that encouragement, that grace that has been set before us in our giving this season, knowing that we're still in that place of multiplication. Amen. The Lord is testing us, and it's such a privilege to know to be given an insight concerning these tests. Even now, I, I'm not gonna hold this, but I remember how the man of God shared with us how he saw those tests that were being placed before us and gave us insight concerning those things. We're, we're just, we're so blessed here in this house, amen? I trust by now that our giving is prepared. If you need an envelope, Brother Kenyatta is here. We'll go ahead and pray. Father, we thank you, O oh God, for your mercy that endure us forever. Truly, oh God, we see how you love us, how you are long-suffering. Father, we come to acknowledge what you have ministered, oh God, what you have spoken to your prophet, your mind, that this time of equipping, oh God, indeed, is coming to an end, and we shall be called, oh God, to do battle. We shall be called to be those ones, oh God, administering firsthand, oh God, your power, your will, oh God, carrying out for your namesake. And Lord, we say unto you that we don't take this opportunity that you have given us lightly. Lord, tonight, as we prepare our offerings, as we're reminded, oh God, of what you have instructed us to give this season sacrificially, oh God, a, a giving that is pleasing unto you, sweet smelling unto you, oh God, let us be encouraged afresh. Lord, we thank you for this house that you have called us to, the eldership that you have presented before us that pours in day in and day out, oh God. Shepherds that you have given us here in the earth. We thank you and we ask of thee that these offerings, oh God, be a sign of our appreciation. Oh God, as they carry out the ministry of the gospel, oh God, and as we are equipped to carry it out as well. We declare that all glory and honor belong to you. And we all said, amen. Hallelujah. Let's celebrate the Lord again. God is good. Y'all know what time it is this Saturday. No slumber November. Let's be ready. Let's be excited. We've been given our marching orders. And don't forget, we'll be praying. Come tomorrow evening, Wednesday, 9 p.m. on Instagram. We want to press into that. And as we have been encouraged, let's see what we can see concerning this meeting that we be prepared as we receive others. Amen. God is good. Everyone have a blessed night.